or, or take a nap or whatever. But uh, I'm sure glad you're here. I, I'm thankful for those who may be tuning in by the live stream. That's a blessing there. And uh, But uh, we're going to sing a couple of good, well, as a matter of fact, three or four good songs this morning. Got a special for you. And then some preaching. And I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do this morning, okay? We all need to right now say to ourselves, God speak to who? Me. God speak to me. Speak to me in every song we sing. Uh, everything that goes on, Lord, speak to me, speak to me, and he will, if you'll listen, he'll speak to you. Amen. Let's pray, then we're going to sing number one in your hymn book. Number one, My Savior's Love. One of my favorite songs, but let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again that we could be here in this place, and we ask you, to, Lord, to once again have your way in each and every heart. And Lord, we always want to say, speak to me. So God, do that today, and we pray that you'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand to sing. Number one. standing. We're going to turn way over to page 480, way toward the back, 480. We're going to sing the first, second, and last of I Want That Mountain. Amen. 480. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First, second, and last. Amen. Oh,
we singing this song because it goes on message this morning. I picked it out. And I think about Caleb in the Bible. Caleb was a visionary. I'm going to preach on that this morning, being a visionary. He visioned for 40 years. He, he visioned getting that parcel of land that God promised him or Moses promised him. When Moses passed off the scene, they crossed over the Jordan River. And he told Joshua, he said, Joshua, remember what Moses said, what belonged to me. He said, I'm, I'm 80 years old, but I'm still ready to go take that mound. Amen. That's because he's a visionary. Amen. Let's sing this next verse. Amen. Amen. Verse number two. There was a time when you listen to That's a great song, isn't it? Matter of fact, those those songs and says, uh, looking at that song, it says talked about the first verse talked about a giant, second verse talked about a giant, third verse talked about a giant, fourth verse talked about a giant, and all through life you're gonna face some giants, amen. But I'm glad, I'm glad we got a God who's in the giant killing business, aren't you? And uh, you may be facing a giant this morning in some capacity. And just realize there's a, that our Heavenly Father, our God, is capable of taking care of every giant situation in your life. All right. Well, uh, just a few announcements to share with you this morning, and then we'll have another good song, okay? Uh, those of you who have somewhat uh, adopted and become a pen pal to a missionary, uh, the letters are in the foyer. Uh, should be a little tag on it with your name on it, and uh, some haven't got a letter yet because I'm going to get an up-to-date letter as possibly I could instead of one from months ago. And uh, those of you who have not signed up to be a, a to help uh, take on a missionary, just to just to uh, communicate with them, okay? Uh, it has nothing to do with money. Just you communicating with them and you getting to know them, them getting to know you. It really will be a blessing to you to get to know them. And uh, if you could take on more than one. Uh, all it'll take is some time. That's all it is. You've got plenty of time. Amen. So if you'll do that, I know it'll be a blessing uh, to you in a great big way. All right. And then also, I would ask that you uh, pray. I'll be uh, leaving on uh, Tuesday and coming back sometime Thursday. Uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm going to be uh, uh, preaching in a, in a youth camp. Almost 71 preaching at a youth camp. And... <laughs> But I'll be there, amen. And how many of you gonna pray for me? Amen. I got to survive the camp, all right. And uh, but anyway, it won't be the first youth camp that I preach. I'm preaching to many of them. Always exciting to me, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, somebody said sometime years ago said you you become who you hang around. Okay, you hang around kids. You you know you might get a little bit of youth kick back then. You all right? Hang around complaining people. All you do is complain. Oh, boy. Well, that's, that's another subject. All right, you do that, all right? And uh, I don't know exactly, but soon and very soon, we're going to get Sunday school started back and the choir. I'm looking forward to doing that. And all this will be left up to your own participation. I'm not going to try to, uh, I'm not going to, try to uh, 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 push you into that, try to lead you into it. And so I, I just want to know we can't, we can't go on, go on without doing this. We're going to soon and very soon get this started back. And I hope that you'll be looking forward to it as much as I am, okay? I do want you to keep on praying for those who are uh, still having to deal with some issues. Some 
uh, maybe have contact with this virus. If you do test positive for it, you know what you need to do. You need to stay home for a couple of weeks and, and get better and whatever and do that, okay? It's a strange virus. Uh, some say, well, it's not a big deal, uh, but I just, I just read a missionary letter that we got uh, yesterday in the mail. said he and his wife both uh, 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 contacted this virus and both of them were very, very sick from it. They're better now. Matter of fact, he said we're in tip-top shape right now. And they contacted on the mission field. And so uh, for some, they have it, don't even know it. For others, they get it and it's really, really uh, sickly. So uh, it's a strange, isn't it? But I'm glad that uh, the Lord's helped us out. Also continue to pray for our president. You know that he's going through a tough time right now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, everything, everything they blamed our president for, uh, Joe Biden's done. Everything they complained of, everything they could talk about us doing, they've done. They, I'm talking about the Democratic Party, that, dem that party that's, that's demon-possessed. I don't mind saying it. I don't mind saying it. Demonic forces run this country, you know that? But our president loves our country. And uh, there are some things that he may say or do that completely you would, I wouldn't agree with and neither would you. But I'm going to tell you one thing. He loves this country. Amen. And uh, so you need to pray for him. Can you imagine being under attack 24 hours a day? Can you imagine going to bed and while you're sleeping, your enemies are wide awake all over the world trying to take you down? Constantly, constantly. It does not matter what he says we want to do. They said that's not the right thing to do. Huh? Now, he ought to use that against them, okay? He ought to be for Black Lives Matter. They'd say, well, he don't mean it. <laughs> but I'm trying to say this. You pray for him. I'm, honestly, our, our country, listen, our country is at stake. Your freedom's at stake. You better listen to Brother Baker. If, if, if the Democratic Party was to be voted in as president and get to Congress and Senate, this nation, this nation would be ruined. Ruined, completely wiped out. I'm talking about it. everything that we know is liberty and freedom would be we would be gone in just a few years. Now that ain't my message. I just want to tell you about that in announcements. Okay, and uh, so you pray, 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 pray. That's the greatest thing you could ever do for the country. All right, let's have another good song. Let's get back in a good spirit. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, you can remain seated on this one. Turn to page three seventy six. 376, you know, there's so much stuff going on, and so much stuff going on, but I'm glad that we know who's going to call in, amen, amen.
that'll help you, won't it? Amen, amen, amen. Uh, this past Wednesday night, I preached a message on going through the book of Philippians on uh, joy, uh, joy over worry and stress, how the joy, how God can strengthen you and help you and all that. So if you wasn't here, you might want to get a copy of that message, and we'll finish it up on this coming Wednesday, okay? All right. Well, anyone have a birthday recently? Anybody at all have a birthday? Nobody had a birthday. Well, I'll tell you what, isn't that something? I'm just going to have to eat this stuff, I reckon. And uh, all right. Well, if nobody has a birthday, anybody had a recent anniversary? Anybody like that? Okay. All right. Uh, anybody been in jail recently? <laughs> nobody been in jail recently? I did call one of my preacher friends up this past week, and they said, he said, hello, Brother Baker, how you doing? I said, I'm not doing good. I, I ain't got time to waste. So what is it? I said, listen very carefully. I need your help. What is it, Brother Baker? I said, you, can you, if I can, I help you. I said, I really need some help. What is it? What is it? I said, listen very carefully. He said, I'm listening. What is it? I said, I'm in jail. I need bail money. <laughs> he said, you what? I said, I'm in jail. I need bail money. He said, I can't help you. <laughs> I said, no, thank God I'm not in jail. And, uh, well, that's the kind of friend he is, you know. All right, well, no, no, no anniversaries, no birthdays. Uh, then we're going to sing another good song. So you come on, Brother Brian, lead us in a good song. Amen. All right, you can stand once again, turn to page 176. We'll sing the first and last of in times like these, amen. And we're in some dark times right now, but I'm glad that he holds a hand, amen. 176 in times like these. this what is this he wants more money he got his mask on amen got his gun he said oh man <laughs> oh boy praise the lord amen let's pray father it's wonderful to know you love us it's wonderful to have an anchor it's wonderful to know that you know already about tomorrow and Lord, help us to remain faithful to thee. You sure have been faithful to us. And we ask you now, Lord, to bless this offering. Lord, I want to thank you for the faithfulness and the giving of your people here. And Lord, I pray that we, we become even more faithful in the days ahead. Please, God, bless this offering. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen.
will tell you what, I sure love our pianist and organist. They do a superb job, don't they? I thank God for that. This next song you're going to hear before I sing is called I'm Redeemed. It's sung by uh, a, a girl's home, a home with girls in it. And, and uh, uh, aren't you glad you're redeemed? Yeah, boy, we've been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. So I hope you'll enjoy it. May it speak to your heart, and then we'll have some preaching. Amen. Aren't you glad you're redeemed? Uh, I tell you what, we're redeemed people. We're no longer in the bondage of sin, the condemnation of sin. We've been redeemed. Let's live like redeemed people. Amen. There's no need to go through life with our head hanging down and our and our jaw dragging the ground and our shoulders slumped over like a, like there's nothing worth living for. I'm telling you what, we got a lot to live for. We got a lot to die for. Amen. And so, uh, anyway, get your Bibles out if you would. And turn to the book of Matthew in chapter number 9. And I'm going to read two verses from this chapter. Then we're going to go over to the book of John in chapter 4 and read from that passage there also. 
I mentioned a few moments ago what I'm going to, what I'm going to be preaching on this morning about being a visionary, being a visionary. Over in the book of Proverbs in chapter 29 in verse 18, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon said, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that's a, it's been a great verse that we've used over the years about having a vision. As a matter of fact, it, it goes more than one way. You could say this, where there is no vision, the people perish. In other words, if you don't have a vision, you're going to perish. And if you don't have a vision, somebody else may perish. And so it's good to have a vision. Uh, and so this morning, I want to preach on uh, being a visionary. Now, when I think about this, look, let's go ahead and look in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 37 and verse number 38. The last two verses of chapter 9 of the book of Matthew. Jesus said... Then saith he unto his disciples, he said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So here we have the Lord talking about a harvest and how we, he, he needs laborers for the harvest. Over in John, in chapter 4, we find this in verse number uh, 35. John 4, 35. Uh, let me read it to you, okay? It says here, uh, uh, Say ye not. Well, let's go back to verse 34. Uh, this, this comes from meeting the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. She's gone back into town. She's told the people there what Jesus has done for her. And she's coming back out to the well. And, uh, and so she's bringing with her the people of the town to meet Jesus. So here's what Jesus said in verse 34. He said, uh, He's talking to his disciples. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. In other words, they, when he said about the harvest, he said, I'm not talking about in four months where you harvest the grain and the wheat and the barley, look up now. And what he's saying is, fellas, look. They're, they're, they had been to town themselves, and they had come back, and he said, I have meat to eat you know not of. And they said, what are you talking Has somebody given him something to eat? No, he had just seen that woman get saved. She'd gone back to town, told the people, now they're on their way back. No, don't doubt my mind as the disciples were coming back from town to Jacob's well that they met this woman, this Samaritan woman who was now saved. And so when they see her, they don't even look at her, they don't even speak to her. And so she came to the well to get water to drink and she got water, everlasting water, amen? And so Jesus said, now fellas, look, don't wait four months I'm not talking about a physical, I'm talking about a, a, a spiritual harvest. Look, the fields are white unto harvest. He's talking about those men and women who are coming out. In other words, Jesus was a visionary. He saw what nobody else saw. Now, what is a visionary? It's an adjective describing someone with a goal in mind, someone with a vision in mind, someone with a dream in mind, uh, somebody that has a, has a great ambition for something. In other words, that seems impossible to do. A visionary is someone who has a vision or a dream or a task that seems impossible to do. In other words, it's something that, that no, maybe nobody else would think of or see. They, they see what others do not see. That's what Christ did here. He saw what his disciples did not see. What are you talking about? Uh, 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 who, who brought you something to eat? 
And now he's talking about uh, uh, another harvest. I thought about this. I'm going to give you just a few, and then we'll get right into the message, okay? I thought about some people in the Bible, there's a whole lot more than this, who were visionaries. For example, Abraham was a visionary. God appears to him and said, Abraham, I want you to get all your family, get everything you've got, pack it all up. I'm going to take you to another land. I've got a land. I've got a country for you. He said, Lord, where is it? He said, I'll just show you. Just follow me. So Abraham packed up everything he had, his wife, his family, all everything he had, and he heads out where? He don't know. He's just following God. He said, God's told me there's a land. There's a country just for me. And Abraham was a visionary. I thought about Noah and the ark. God appears to Noah and says, Noah, here's what. He said, I've seen the wickedness of man upon the earth. And I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to wipe it all out because of their wickedness. He said, I want you to do something. I want you to build me an ark. And here's, how, here's the size and the dimensions of it. Here's how I want you to do it. Now, God gave the details. Can you imagine if you've ever been up to Ohio? I think it's in Ohio or Kentucky, that ark. Kentucky. We went there a couple of years ago. Miss Baker and I were able to see that. Boy, it's something else. And it's supposed to be built uh, to the dimensions of the one that Noah had. And when you see that thing, Noah had to be a visionary. In other words, Noah, it took him 120 years to build it. And uh, you say, how could, a, how could a one man do all that? Well, he didn't build it by himself. He had help. He had to gather materials. Could it have been that even the people who lived in his day and time assisted him in building that ark? I mean, lost people. The fact is, he was a visionary. God said, Noah, here's what's coming. Judgment's coming. But I have a safe place and after the ark was completed and the animals came in of their own, God left the door open for seven days and nobody came in but Noah and his family. Noah was a visionary. I thought about Caleb. We sang about that song a while ago, I Want That Mountain. Caleb is up in his senior years of life, you would say, 80 years old. And, and now, now they're going over to take, uh, to take the land that God's promised them. And Abraham comes to uh, Joshua and says, Joshua, we, uh, we've grown up together. We, we, we both supported Moses. We've both been through that 40 years of wilderness and now we're going to go over and we're going to uh, possess the land that God's going to give us. Now, uh, 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 he said, Joshua, you remember what Moses said? He gave me a portion for me and my family. I want that mountain. And of course, he got that mountain. There's no doubt in my mind uh, that Caleb was a visionary. I can imagine as, as they are in the desert day after day, week after week, year after year, people dying by the thousands. He's got one thing on his mind. One of these days, I'm going to be out of this wilderness. One of these days, we're going to be out of here. One of these days, I'll have that land that God's promised me. He's a visionary. Amen. I thought about Gideon and his 300 men. <laughs> against thousands and how it dwindled down and God told Gideon, he said, Gideon, here's how we're going to do it and you're going to head this thing up. And G Gideon was just a farmer, a plow boy, you might say. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't a great general, but he was a visionary. God said, here's how we're going to do it. He said, okay, Lord. I thought about Ruth, the wonderful book of Ruth and Ruth and, and uh, how, how she met Boaz. And uh, here she was, a Gentile woman coming to a land and, and her husband had died and her mother, I mean, everything. She only had one person who cared about her and that was Naomi. And Naomi said to Ruth, Boaz has got his eye on you. Naomi's a visionary and Ruth becomes a visionary. And Naomi says now to Ruth, Ruth, if you do what I tell you, I believe, I believe that God will help us or help you in this. And so Naomi was a visionary. Naomi told Ruth exactly what to do. Ruth obeyed her, did what she said, and Ruth ended up marrying the richest man in the country. How about that? Boaz. Woo! Isn't that? So here we have Ruth a visionary, Naomi a visionary, and, and look what happened. And then well, I thought about Esther. And uh, over in the book of Esther and, and how uh, her uncle Mordecai and how, how uh, Haman had, had somehow or another convinced the king to kill all the Jews. 
Well, unbeknown to him, uh, uh, Esther was a Jew, and so was Mordecai. And so uh, 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 Esther becomes the queen. And Mordecai comes to her and says, Now, Esther, thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, you've got to go before the king. And you've got to present your case. You've got to go before the king. If you don't do this, Esther, then we're going to be killed. Our people would be put to death by wicked Haman. And so Esther, she said, okay, that's what I'll do. And so Esther became a visionary. She said, if I go before the king and he doesn't accept me, I'll be put to death. So she put her life on the line. And yet when she went before him and made her request and everything that, that uh, Haman had planned to do to Mordecai and the people of God was done to him, he built the gallows to hang Mordecai. And those very gallows that he built, he hung upon. Isn't that amazing? All because of one woman and one man who had a vision. Then I thought about this, the disciples in the gospel. We just read that, didn't we? Matter of fact, we, Jesus said, fellas, uh, don't wait four months for the harvest. He said, uh, the harvest is ready now. He wasn't talking about a harvest of grain and wheat and barley. He's talking about a harvest of souls. And so Jesus was a visionary. Later on, we find that the disciples become men of visions. And so I'm going to give you some things this morning about this matter of being a visionary. Listen, if you are not growing, if you are not growing as a Christian, a child of God, then you are dying. Come on now. You're either growing or dying. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what age you are. Does it matter your background? If you are saved, you're to continue to grow and mature in the things of God. And you need to be a visionary. You need to have a vision uh, that God has given you or you even give yourself. First of all, a visionary sees what others do not see. They see what others do not see. If you go back and study the lives of, of great scientists, are, are great, great political leaders or military leaders, uh, great educators and great, great statesmen. I won't call them politicians. Great statesmen. You know what it was? They were visionaries. George Washington was a visionary. Christopher Columbus was a visionary. Christopher Columbus in his diary, he, he stated in his diary that he's looking for that land so that they could propagate the gospel and worship God freely. He was a visionary. Oh my, you look at the men who signed the Declaration of Independence and most of them lost their lives and lost their fortunes because they were visionaries. Every great preacher I know, doesn't matter where he lived, what era he lived in, every great preacher I know was a visionary. As a matter of fact, Every great Christian I know is a visionary. Why? They see what others do not see. They see something, they see something there that others may look at and say, oh, oh you're wasting your time. That's not going to work. You can't do that. You can't build that boat. Noah preached for 120 years and nobody got saved. Nobody. My buddy, after the flood came, they wanted to get saved, but it was too late. And so we understand. Do you realize that some of the early settlers when, and the, when the war for independence was fought, many of the early settlers thought we cannot, we can't stand against the, uh, the big army of Great Britain and England. They'll wipe us out. But they didn't. All because of great men. And so it takes somebody who sees what others do not see. Number two, it takes faith in God if you're going to be a visionary. Your faith and trust in him and him alone. You see, when you have faith in God, God can help you. He can help you put some confidence in him when you have faith. Faith is you having complete confidence that God can get it done through you. That you don't have the capability of doing it. When, when God spoke to Caleb, Caleb said, what? You want me to do this? I don't have the capabilities but God said, yes, you do. When he came to Moses and said, Moses, I want to use you to deliver my people. Moses said, I, 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 I'm not good with words and I don't know how, I don't, I'm not able to do it. God said, I'll be your mouth. 
First he said, your brother will be in your mouth. Later on we find that Moses did his own talking. A faith or a trust in God, a confidence in God. If you're going to be a visionary, you're going to have, have confidence in God. Not in yourself, but in him working through you. Doesn't matter what it is. Confidence in God that, that you can be that, that mother that God wants you to be, that wife that God wants you to be, that husband, that father. Confidence to raise your boys right, raise your girls right. So it takes faith in God to be a visionary. Then I thought about this. It requires human effort. The Bible says faith without what is dead. Faith without works is dead. And Paul said, I... Listen, my works are there, and I'm going to show you my, Paul said, I'm going to show you my faith by my works, by my works. I remember a couple of years ago, Brother Willis preached a message in camp meeting entitled, A Faith That Works. A Faith That Works. And his whole message had to do with you and I doing what God would have us to do. Faith without works is dead. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Can you prove it? Is there anything in your life that can prove you're a child of God? Anything. Is there any, any evidence that you are living by faith? It requires human effort works. You see, I wrote this down. And for real elementary, way down on the bottom shelf, here it is. God needs you. He wouldn't hurt you to say this. God needs me. Oh, but Brother Baker, no, no, no. We need God. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we need him more than he needs us. But the fact is he needs us. It's not going to hurt you to say, the Lord needs me. Why? He saved you so that he could use you. He saved you so he could put you to work. Amen. And so what I'm simply saying is, thank God he can use us. Amen. He didn't save us. Say, well, you just you get over there and sit down, take it easy, and I'll take care of stuff. That's not the way he operates. You look at the lives of these people I just mentioned that I just read off. I think it was about seven or eight of them. Every one of them uh, were in a situation, a dangerous situation, a difficult situation, and God said, here's what I want you to do. And they did it. Against all odds, they did it. And came out on the good for it. So there is work for you to do. There's a work for everybody to do. And so if you're going to be a visionary, it requires human effort. God working through you. Oh, my soul. And then number four, it requires obedience. You know, you can know to do right, not do it. You can know not to do wrong and do that. And the Bible says if you know to do what is right and good and you don't do it, then it is sin. When you, when you knowingly know what you need to do and should do and you don't do it, it is sin in God's eyes. It's the sin of disobedience. We have the idea that uh, it's the sins that we commit that, that God's not pleased with. Uh, it's the things that we don't do, I believe, that disappoint him more than anything. And I've said this many times. The busier you are doing God's will, the less likely you'll be involved in any sin. You won't be sinless, but less likely you'll be involved in any type of sin. So it requires obedience. Think about this. All the do's and all the don'ts. Huh? All the do's and all the don'ts. Now, we live in a day and time where so-called modern-day preachers have just completely gotten away with the do's and don'ts of God's Word. Well, I'm not going to go to that church. Why? Well, over there, you can't do anything. Well, over there, you can't do this and you can't do that. I'm not going over there. I'm going to find me a church where I can do what I want to do and not have to worry about preached on it. You'll never be a visionary there. You'll never, you'll never amount to anything for God in that capacity. And by the way, a preacher who has that, that mentality will never be a great man of God. Never will he be. I mean, think about this. John the Baptist, his whole mission in life, his whole mission in life was to prepare the way for who? The Lord Jesus. That's a, he, that was his message. He said, preach. He said, repent 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, repent, repent. So Jesus comes on the scene. John the Baptist reckoned, of course, he knew who he was. He'd known him since he was born. They were, they were, their, their mothers were or sisters. We would look, we look at it this way. John and Jesus were cousins. Are you listening? So this was not like John, when Jesus came over that hill that day to be baptized, it wasn't like that's the first time he'd ever seen Jesus. He grew up with him. Matter of fact, when John was in his mother's womb and Mary showed up with Jesus, her womb, John was filled with the Holy Ghost, jumped inside of her, boy. And so it requires obedience. John had to be obedient to the Lord. It cost him his life. It chopped his head off. And so John was a visionary. John said, I must, uh, I must decrease and he must increase. John was a visionary. Oh, then I thought about this. Uh, it requires sacrifice. If you're going to be a visionary, you're going to, it's going to require personal sacrifice. I'm talking about you giving up your playtime for work time. You giving up playtime for serving God. You giving up throwing money away on this, that, and there and using that for the glory of God. You being the woman, you being the man, you being the teenager, you being the little boy and girl who, has, who, who, who says, uh, I'm, I want to do what God wants in my life. At a young age, every mama and daddy ought to, ought to have a, a vision for their children. I'll say more about that in just a few moments. But it requires sacrifice. Everyone I just mentioned a while ago, those and many more in the Bible were people who were willing to sacrifice even their very life. Really were. Being a visionary means I cannot, I, I, I don't want to waste any time, I don't want to waste any money, I don't want to waste anything. Why? This is my vision. It's going to benefit, it's not just benefit me, it's going to benefit people. It's going to benefit humanity. I thought about this. Every parent needs to be a visionary. Yeah. Every parent, mom or dad, needs to be a visionary. You need to see your child getting saved. <laughs> Most moms and dads never see that. They never see it. But while they see that, they work at it. How do they work at it, Brother Baker? They take that child when, before they're even born. The child is, is in the mother's womb. And that mother is, is, is singing. Do you know that children that's not yet born can hear? <laughs> John the Baptist proves that. A mom and dad need to be visionaries for their children. Them getting saved and working at that endeavor. Now they can't save them, but as soon as they can, they pick that baby up and sings, Jesus loves you, this I know. <laughs> And from the very time that child can understand or comprehend, they need to know who Jesus is. Amen. And that way, at an early age, an early age, they call upon Christ to save them. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. You don't have to wait till your kids are 19 and 20 to get saved. You're, a, a parent needs to be... Now, the child has to understand... But boy, that mom and dad praying and, and, and having a vision for them, seeing them get, so when they get saved, mom and daddy says, praise God, I felt like it's going to happen. Why? They're visionaries. Can you vision, can you vision your kids going through school? Huh? Living for God, being a good testimony in school, in grammar school, junior high, high school. Can you vision your kids getting gradu graduating and that daughter, that son saying, you know, this is what I'm going to be because this is what God wants me to be. Where do they get that from? Mom and dad's vision. Mom and dad's vision. Mom and dad telling that little boy, that little girl, God has a will for you. Telling that little, marrying that, marrying that young man, that young lady who loves the Lord. And that's who they meet and that's who they married. Mom and dad said, well, praise God. Amen. You see, visionaries who work at it, <laughs> uh, there's not a whole lot in their life that gets them down because they see their kids living for God. Amen. Come on now. Every parent needs to be a visionary. Everyone. How about this? Every pastor needs to be a visionary. 
A pastor has no vision for his church that he's going to die and the church is going to die with him. Now, when I use the word visionary, I'm not talking about numbers. Numbers has nothing to do with it. Uh, Noah's numbers didn't look good, did they? <laughs> no. How would you like to preach for 120 years and nobody gets saved? Uh, that's not a good record, is it? How would you like for God to tell you, and you, you're going to fight the biggest army in the, in the world at that time, and God says, you got too many, you got 10,000, that's too many. Go get it down to 300. And so, numbers is not the issue. Every pastor needs to be a visionary. He needs to see his people growing. He needs to see them maturing. He needs to see them doing the things that he's preached over the years. I appreciate so very much your love for others. It blesses my heart to hear someone say to me, Brother Baker, you won't believe what, what I received this week. And I said, what is it? And they'll say, well, I don't know who did it, but somebody did this and this and this for me. You know what that tells me? You've been listening. Others, others, others. But even there's still more that we can do. Come on. I'm trying to get you to, I'm trying right now to get you involved in missions. In what way? I'm trying to get you to say, take on a missionary, be a pen pal, connect with them, write them, communicate with them, get to know them and let them get to know you. That will help you. Can you see that in your mind? I mean, you're going to meet a man and a woman who uh, may have kids right now, maybe not right now, may have a whole bunch. But you're going to get to know them and they're going to introduce you to some missions. Get involved in that. Every preacher needs to be a visionary. Every pastor. Every evangelist needs to be a, a, a visionary. Preaching the gospel all over the region that he lives in and, and, and helping the pastor out and helping churches. Every evangelist, every missionary needs to be a visionary. And there's work involved in that. And you think about it, every missionary is, is going to have to sacrifice to do that. Every Sunday school teacher must be a visionary. Huh? Every Sunday school teacher. Now, the thing about it, uh, Sunday school teacher says, well, I like, like to see my class grow. It ain't going to grow unless you go. It will not grow unless you go. Go where? Go find them. If you've got a Sunday school class of, of, of junior boys or girls or teens or beginners, you need to look. You need to, hey, on your way to work, look, uh, on your way to, to work or school, look for, look for uh, uh, swing sets in people's yards or bicycles and say, there's some kids might like, I think I'm going to stop by that house and see what ages those kids are. And, if they, and invite them to church and let them know I'm the Sunday school teacher. And I'd love to have their kids in my Sunday school class. That's a visionary. But the average Sunday school teacher is not a visionary. You know what they're waiting on? Church members' kids to fill our class instead of lost kids. Woo! I was talking with a young man just a few, several years ago, and uh, he went to a church, and he was the youth. They, they hired him for the summer to be the uh, uh, summer youth director. Church couldn't hire him full-time year-round, so they had him come in. He had just graduated from college and was in uh, we called, called to preach. And so they said, we'll take you for the summer. You come. And so at the time that he came, there was little to no young folks in the church at all. And so this, this, this young man, just, just out of college, Bible college, decides, well, Here's what I'm going to do. He goes to the pastor. He says, Pastor, I want to make sure that I, that I do everything you want me to do. I don't want to go outside your back. Am I free to invite all the youth I can find to church? And the pastor said, yes, sir, son. You can invite all the youth you want. And he said, okay. And he went out and everywhere he saw where there might be a, a young person, whether it was six years old or 18 or in college, he went after them. Before the summer was over, the youth department was bigger than the church membership in one summer. That young man became on the staff immediately. <laughs> Pastor, we're going to keep you. And later on, the church began to grow. The parents and grandparents of those kids that were getting saved began to get saved. And the church grew and prospered. The pastor finally retired, didn't, I mean, retired. 
and that, that young man who did that. And that church today in Florida is still growing today. A visionary. Do you have, are you a visionary? Every Sunday school, every staff member, doesn't matter who it is, the pianist, the organist, the choir director, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, don't matter who they are, every staff member needs to be a visionary. Church secretaries, church clerks, all these need to be uh, 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 teachers. Church members need to be visionaries. Did not Christ tell all of us go to all the world? When you got saved, when I got saved, whoo, boy. Think about that now. Visionaries, visionaries. Are you one? Think about this. God the Father was a visionary. I want you to listen to this verse out of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Listen to this verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now in this chapter, uh, uh, in the book of Isaiah, this chapter pertains to the arrest and, and, and trial and crucifixion of Christ. The whole chapter deals with that. Paints a picture of how Christ would die. And in that verse, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now the Lord is God the Father, and the him there is Jesus. It pleased God the Father to bruise Jesus. God the Father was a visionary. Now why? Because God the Father looked beyond the cross, looked beyond the cross, and saw you and I getting saved. It, what, it pleased God the Father when Christ died because he knew that the death of his son would open the door to get to him. Aren't you glad that the Father was a visionary? He was seeing you and I getting saved. Not only that, not only was God the Father a visionary, Jesus Christ himself was a visionary. He said, the Son of Man hath come to seek and to save that which was lost. Those are the words of Christ. He said, I lay down my life. Nobody takes it. No man taketh my life. I lay it down and I take it up of myself. Jesus was a visionary. What kind of vision did he have? Same thing the Father had. They had the same vision. Jesus looked beyond the cross. He looked beyond the crucifixion. He looked beyond the cat of nine tails. He looked beyond the beating in the face. He looked beyond the darkness and the vinegar and all that, the shame and all. He looked beyond that and just saw you and I getting saved. God the Father was a visionary. God the Son was a visionary. And God the Holy Ghost was a visionary. Do you realize without the, without the working of the Holy Spirit, Matter of fact, I'll prove that to you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, listen to this. That after the Holy Ghost, Jesus is, these are the words of Christ. That after the, uh, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses of me. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses of me. And so holy, the Holy Spirit was sent to indwell in us, not just to comfort us, not just to be our companion, the Holy Spirit came because he wants to empower us with the gospel. A visionary. The Holy Spirit is not happy if we're not witnessing for Christ. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we don't do the will of God. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin deliberately. The Holy Spirit is a visionary. He looks and he sees and he sees you and he wants to work in you. Do you see what the Holy Spirit sees? When I use the word Holy Spirit, you know I'm talking about Jesus, don't you? He is the, he, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same. And so the Holy Spirit's a visionary. I believe that our president is a visionary. How about that? You ever thought about that? When he was, when he was campaigning to be our president, here's what he said. Let's make America what? Great again. Let's rebuild our factories. Let's, let's quit sending our jobs across the, the globe. Let's put those jobs back here. Let's open things up. Let's do this. And do you realize in three and a half years, he had created more jobs, more opportunities than the last 35 years put together because it's visionary. But you think America's remembering that? 
No, they're not remembering that. And now he says, let's keep America great. I'm telling you, I don't want to get off, that, get off my message. I want to say this. Our president's a visionary. We need to see what he sees. But more than that, our God's a visionary. He has something for you to do. What, preacher? I'm not God. Find out what it is. I do know this. Whatever you know to do, do it. Whatever good you know to do, do it. Because if you don't do it, you sin. Do, do the will of God while you wait on the will of God. You know it's the will of God to be in church, don't you? Amen. You know it's the will of God to read your Bible? Well, read it. You know it's the will of God to pray? Well, pray. You know it's the will of God to witness? Well, start witnessing. You know it's the will of God to tithe? Start tithing. You know it's the will of God to love your neighbor as yourself? Amen. When are you going to start doing that? On and on I could go with the will of God. Do the will of God while you wait on the will of God. That's all you do. You know, uh, in this day and time in which we live, it just seems like everything's out of control, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But I'm telling you, our God is a visionary God. Hey, I don't know about today, but I know who what? Holds tomorrow. Hey, hey that don't make you want to shout. And while we're waiting for Christ to come back and anticipating that or why, why in other words, I'm not, I'm not looking to die. I'm looking to be caught up. Amen. Now I may die, but that's okay. But I'm looking for the rapture. I'm not looking for death. I'm looking for revival. I'm not looking for a recliner to lay in. I'm looking for revival. My point is this. God's in control of everything. We don't, don't forget that now. Do what, you, do what you have to do, but be a visionary. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you see this morning? Huh? What do you see? Can I give you just a little simple illustration and I'll close? When I was in high school, we had a head coach and we had an offensive coach and a defensive coach. We had three coaches and some managers. Our offensive coach was a brilliant man. I mean, fresh out of college for a couple of years and had, had, a, had a mind for the offense. You know what the offense is? That's, that's trying to score the touchdown. The defense keeps folks from scoring. But our offensive coach was a brilliant. He was actually, and our head coach was a good man, but he didn't have, a, he didn't have the, the mind of this offensive coach. And this offensive coach had plays. Oh, my. But our head coach would never hardly use them. He was just three yards in a cloud of dust. The place you saw 10 years ago, he still used them. But our offensive coach was a visionary man. He put new plays in, and the head coach very seldom used them. We lost two games that season. You know why we lost them? Head coach wasn't a visionary man. The offensive coach said, well, and he pulled us aside after the game. He said, listen, fellas, we kept saying, Coach Herlong, when are we going to run these plays you've been putting? He said, when the coach lets me put them in. So we played the last game of the season. We have played a team undefeated. We lost two games. We lost two games, one by, one, one by six points, one by 12 points. We shouldn't have lost them. Now it's the last game. You know what that head coach did? We are playing a team undefeated. We've lost two games. We played it at their home field. Conference championship. And the head coach says to the, he said, well, I'm going to let you call all the plays. Guess what? We beat that team on their field 14 to 6. And the touchdown they scored really didn't even score, just sort of gave it to them. I'm telling you why. We'd have never lost any game had the head coach been a visionary. Are you a visionary? Not just in sports, but in your life. Be a visionary. See your kids growing up and being, being godly men and godly ladies. Seeing yourself being somebody for the glory of God. Not just to be somebody, but seeing, being somebody that God says, I'm a proud of you. Huh? Amen. He's in control. Aren't you glad of that? Let, if he is, let him control your life. I'm going to pray. I'm going to let you remain seated. But during this invitation, if God has spoken to your heart this morning about what you see, 
what you, what you would like to be involved in. Age has nothing to do with this. You say, well, I'm too old, too sick. No, 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 no. You can be a visionary. Uh, you can. Father in heaven, bless now the invitation. I'm glad you're in control. I'm glad, Lord, that you know about our tomorrows. And the song, dear God, that we're fixing to play over the PA system, the song about in control, I pray, God, that as these young folks sing this song, God, you use it to speak to our hearts this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will just get a hold of the hearts of the congregation. And Lord, they'd be obedient to you today and get a vision, get a dream, a goal in mind about the future. Their life could depend on it, the lives that are friends and family could depend on it. So you speak to every heart in Christ's name. Amen. Listen to the song as it's played. Mind the Lord. Lord Jesus. While crossing over Galilee, a storm In an out of control world, stay with the controlling God. In your trials and storms, He can calm you, calm the storms. Be a visionary. Visionaries look beyond the hardships. Visionaries look beyond. The sacrifice. They see success. They see a touch of God. You may, your visionary may, you being, just being a prayer warrior. And as you see God answer your prayers, you rejoice in it. Every little boy, every little girl, no matter what age, needs to be a visionary. We live in a stormy, stormy world. Danger everywhere. But I tell you what, God's in control. Let him control your heart, your mind. He's always with you. Always with you. He's in control. Let's stand to our feet. Ruth plays. We're going to play one stanza of a song. Maybe you need to come again. Others have already come. Ruth, would you play? your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Is a, is a farmer a visionary? Is he? Well, if he's not, he better quit farming. <laughs> 
He plows the ground, fertilizes it, puts the seed in, and expects it to what? Grow and him harvest it. He's a visionary. Amen. And so Jesus said, some will plant, some will water, he'll give the increase. You'll be a visionary. We'll see you tonight around 6.30. I hope you have a great afternoon. Be careful going home. And go home and get you a little bit of rest. Today's Sunday. Rest a while. Amen.